Tonight is a continuation again of what we had planned for 2020. Our speaker tonight was originally going to be at the museum for this very presentation on March 25th last year. It's only taken us 51 weeks to get him back into our program. We will have a Q&A period at the end of the talk. Please submit your questions through the Q&A icon on your screen. This evening's presentation is entitled The Heroic Age of Diving, America's Underwater Pioneers and the Great Wrecks of Lake Erie. The author of a book by the same name is Jerry Coombs. He is a researcher and writer residing in New York's Hudson River Valley. His books include biographies on exceptional but little known 19th century Americans, Wild West Show sharpshooters, pioneer aviators, baseball league promoters, dance hall dinesons, a teenage Amazon plant hunter, and early apparatus divers. Currently, he is researching the balloon parachuting craze of the 1890s. Jerry was educated at Earlham College and Rutgers University, where he earned a master's in library and information science. Good evening, Jerry. Hello, good and evening. Take it away. My talk tonight is based on my book, The Heroic Age of Diving, America's Underwater Pioneers and the Great Wrecks of Lake Erie. In part one of that book, I describe the first 12 years of apparatus diving in America from 1837 to 1849. In those chapters, there are only brief mentions of Lake Erie, but that section sets the background for part two which covers diving in the 1850s with a focus on three famous wrecks of palace steam steamers in Lake Erie, the Erie, the GP Griffith, and the Atlantic. It was during that decade of the 1850s that Lake Erie was the most active diving locality in the world. It was on Lake Erie that new underwater engineering technologies were employed in efforts to salvage those wrecks. But the salvage of those wrecks also involved a compelling tragic tale, the story of diver John D. Green. But before I get to his story, I want to briefly review some of that earlier context on the origins of apparatus diving. Slide. The history of diving in America involves what is known as technology transfer between England and the, United, and the United States. The first practical diving apparatus originated in England from the efforts of brothers John and Charles Dean, with significant improvements made by Augustus Seabee. They are credited with inventing the first working underwater assisted breathing apparatus, which eventually became known as standard dress. Charles Dean's original intent was to offer a firefighter's outfit, as we see in his patent drawing. Slide. In 1837, Charles Dean's original patent for a smoke helmet expired and Augustus Seabee started working with other engineers. Seabee was British of German descent. One of his collaborators, an inventor named George Edwards, suggested to Seabee a design consisting of a closed sealed fabric suit, including a helmet bolted to flanges. Seabee was successful with that design and in many instances, he has been solely credited as the inventor of standard dress, although he based his improvements on the ideas of the Deans, Edwards, and others. But if any one person could be called the founder of diving, it would be Augustus Seabee. Slide. As CB was trying to perfect diving equipment, the general public was becoming aware of diving thanks to an exhibition Charles Dean made in London in 1836 of some artifacts he had salvaged from the wreck of the HMS Royal George. The exhibit was accompanied by a book illustrating his efforts. Slide. 
That famous wreck made a name for John and Charles Dean, but they only extracted a small clutch of artifacts from it. The hulk of the HMS Royal George had been an obstacle to navigation for over 50 years, ever since it sank while at anchor in Portsmouth, England. The job of clearing the wreck went not to the Deans, but to Colonel William Pasley of the British Royal Engineers. Pasley employed divers with the new CB gear to collect the remaining cannons from the ship and to help lay the charges for blasting it. Slide. The book and exhibit that Charles Dean promoted in London in 1836 was seen by a visiting American, a former privateer captain from North Carolina named William Hannes Taylor. Taylor had the idea that this new diving apparatus could be used for a different purpose. While he was raiding shipping in the Caribbean in the 1820s as a privateer on behalf of Argentina, Taylor saw pearls being collected by divers with no equipment. Recalling that experience, Taylor returned to New York in 1837 and wrote a booklet called a new and alluring source of enterprise in the treasures of the sea and the means of gathering them. William Taylor was convinced that apparatus divers could gather many more pearls than free divers. Slide. But Taylor was also aware that pearl divers faced many dangers, foremost among them being sharks. Slide. In 1837, Taylor returned to New York and patented his own diving apparatus, which employed large tin sheets to act as armor against sharks. It's not clear how aware Taylor was of the improvements that Augusta Seabee had already made to diving apparatus in England. Slide. This clipping from August 1837 documents the first demonstration of Taylor's submarine armor in the Hudson River. There are no known reports of any Dean, CB, or other English diving equipment being used in North America prior to this date. So this clipping represents the first instance of American apparatus diving. As a technology, apparatus diving predates photography and predates the telegraph. Slide. To publicize his new submarine armor, William Taylor took his equipment to Long Island to try to recover artifacts from two very famous wrecks which had taken place a couple of years earlier. The Bristol and the Mexico foundered in November 1836 and January 1837 just yards from shore near Rockaway Beach. Slide. After two years of trying to promote his submarine armor with little success, William Hannes Taylor got bored of that effort and instead turned his attention to the development of electric motors. He moved to England, which was the engineering capital of the world and patented a unique motor. Today, this is known as a switched reluctance motor. William Hannes Taylor left the submarine armor business to his assistant, a man named George W. Taylor, who was no relation. George Taylor kept up the practice of making public demonstrations of the armor, hoping to sell it to the Navy, ship owners, and wreckers. From 1839, until the end of the 1840s, about 10 years, George Taylor and his crew of divers were responsible for all diving activity in the Western Hemisphere. Slide. In January 1840, the opulent passenger steamer Lexington caught on fire and sank in the middle of Long Island Sound. Of 143 people on board, only four survived. One of the victims was Adolphus Harden, one of the partners in Harden's Express Company. George Taylor was asked to come and try to recover the Express Company's valuables. 
Taylor made it down to 140 feet, 114 feet, but was barely able to function. He grabbed some metal fra uh, fragments and then was forced to give up the effort. The money of the express company was never recovered. Keep this in mind because one of the junior partners in Harnden's express company was a man named Henry Wells, whose name we'll encounter again in a few minutes. Next slide. Meanwhile, in the 1840s, thanks to the Erie Canal, shipping was booming on Lake Erie. The Great Lakes became the most popular route for the Western migration of American settlers and for the supplies they needed, and also for the goods they produced and sent eastward. In 1841, the pride of the passenger lines was the steamer Erie, shown here in its glory. This is just a terrific example of maritime painting. Slide. Like the Lexington, the Erie was destroyed by a fire that started near its smokestacks. Over 200 people were killed, many of them immigrants carrying their life savings. George Taylor brought his diving equipment to Lake Erie in 1842, the year after the Erie sank. While in the region, he gave demonstrations in Buffalo, Cleveland, and Detroit, but he also attempted dives over the Erie wreck site, but he was not able to recover anything from it. Aside from George Taylor, several attempts were made to reach the Erie with diving bells through the 1840s. And those efforts were successful in recovering some machinery, but the rumored treasure of coins was never found, and the diving bell entrepreneurs made little profit for all their trouble. Slide. Throughout the 1840s, George Taylor hired and trained several skilled divers. Foremost among them was James A. Whipple a young mechanical engineer from Boston. Whipple not only was a capable diver, but he also improved the Taylor diving gear. It is quite likely that through the 1840s, George Taylor and Whipple started to adopt features of the CB standard dress. But one advantage that Taylor and Whipple may have had over English equipment was in the quality of their rubber suits and hoses. Taylor was good friends with and a partner of the Goodyear brothers. Slide. Whipple became the most famous diver in America when he was called in to help salvage the wreck of the Elizabeth, which sank near Fire Island, New York in July 1850. One of the victims was a celebrity, the transcendentalist writer and women's rights advocate, Margaret Fuller. Ralph Waldo Emerson sent Henry David Thoreau down to Long Island to search for her body, which was never found. Slide. Also aboard the Elizabeth was a huge marble statue of Senator John Calhoun, made in Italy by American sculptor Hiram Powers. Calhoun had recently died and was a symbol of great pride to the Southern states because he was the leading defender of the institution of slavery. James Whipple was hired to help recover the statue. He succeeded and suddenly found himself quite famous. By the way, uh, Whipple was a Quaker, so he probably would have had no great respect for Calhoun's politics. Slide. In the late 1840s, the United States government hired George Taylor to make a survey to determine how to remove the wreck of the USS Missouri, which sank near Gibraltar off the coast of Spain. The Missouri wreck created a navigational hazard to the British port on Gibraltar. George Taylor was definitely ill by that time, so most of the diving to survey the wreck was done by Whipple. Slide. George Taylor and Whipple fully expected to get the final contract to remove the uh, Missouri, but instead it was awarded to two Boston businessmen, Thomas Wells and John Gowan. 
Wells and Gowan had started to make their own diving suits in 1850 after first importing English equipment and English divers. There was probably more than a little politics involved in the awarding of that contract. Slide. James Whipple was disappointed and probably shocked to lose the Missouri contract. Instead, he led efforts to recover gold from a Spanish galleon, the San Pedro de Alcantara, which was lying in shallow waters off the coast of South America. You see here that those efforts included both divers and diving bells. Off to the bottom right, we see the diver and right in the center, we see a diving bell. Slide. So we just saw an illustration that included diving bells. For many decades of the 19th century, it wasn't clear whether um, diving dress was superior to diving bells. Both needed support vessels. Diving bells were immensely heavy and awkward to deploy, and they had to be used in calm waters. But they supported more than one man, and workers within a bell could easily bend, grab, and, and lift objects. An American engineer named Henry Sears invented a mobile diving bell he called the Nautilus. It had air chambers to control flotation, and it could anchor itself in one place and then use a propeller to move the bell around that spot. It was half diving bell and half submarine. Sears once demonstrated the Nautilus in England, and one of the observers was Jules Verne, just before he wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea featuring his own Nautilus. Slide. Sears Nautilus could also lift large, heavy objects. Slide. A different approach to salvage was taken by American engineer James Eads, who made a fortune as a wrecker on the Mississippi. He used divers and diving bells and a special double hull wrecking steamer, which he called a submarine, that had gantry work that could be used to lift ships out of the water. Slide. Wrecking was also revolutionized by derricks mounted on barges. Divers were used to place chains around a sunken ship, which were then lifted by these arrays of block and tackle. Slide. You may have heard of the Hunley, but did you know that there were working American submarines years before the Civil War? An inventor from Indiana named Laudner Phillips was building submarines in the late 1840s. Slide. Phillips built a submarine in 1852 named the Marine Cigar. This diagram of the Marine Cigar appeared in Scientific American. Note that it has two mechanisms to control mechanical arms outside the hull. You see those right in the center. Also note that it has a hatch on the bottom designed to allow divers to enter and exit, which would have required a pressurized cabin. Slide. Incredibly, in the early 1850s, Laudner Phillips also designed an atmospheric diving suit, decades before they were first demonstrated in public. An atmospheric diving suit does not require pressurized air. It just relies on a super strong shell to resist water pressure. You can consider an atmospheric diving suit as a hybrid between a Nautilus diving bell, a submarine, and standard dress. In an atmospheric suit, you don't have to worry about the bends because you're breathing air at normal pressure, and you don't need strong pumps to force air down to you. All you need to worry about is getting a leak in the suit from the enormous water pressure. If that happens, you likely won't survive. Slide. So that concludes my whirlwind look at diving salvage technology leading up to the early 1850s. 
all the technologies that I just mentioned were brought to bear to salvage those three famous wrecks on Lake Erie. The first wreck I previously mentioned, the steamer Erie, caught fire and sank near Silver Creek in 1841 and was still on the bottom of the lake in the early 1850s. The second great wreck was that of the steamer G.P. Griffith near Fairport in 1850. Once again, hundreds of immigrant passengers lost their lives. And once again, rumors swirled that they carried with them thousands of dollars in gold and silver coins. Slide. The third great wreck was the worst of all. The steamer Atlantic sank near Long Point in August 1852 after colliding with another ship. Between 200 and 300 lives were lost. The Atlantic sank in the deepest part of Lake Erie near Long Point at about 165 feet. Also lost was a safe belonging to the American Express Company containing about $37,000 in currency and banknotes. That's $37,000 in 1852 money. So multiply that by about 50 and you might get an idea. Slide. The president of American Express was Henry Wells, who also founded the Wells Fargo Company. Wells had been a junior partner of Harndon's Express Company when Adolphus Harndon was lost in the Lexington fire. Henry Wells did not want a repeat of that devastating blow to his company. So he resolved to get back his safe by using the latest technology. Slide. Just days after the Atlantic sank, Wells brought in former Taylor divers from New York and he also told Henry Sears to bring his Nautilus diving bell to Buffalo. Slide. And Wells thought it wise to hire the most experienced local diver familiar with Lake Erie, a man named John B. Green. I use the word experienced, but Green had started apparatus diving just two months prior to his invitation to join the Wells expedition. Now, by introducing the name of John B. Green, the story that I'm telling changes from just being a race to salvage those three famous wrecks to a more personal story about a man whose life had its own wrecks and salvages. We know much of his history from a short autobiography he wrote, Diving With and Without Armor. The title reflects the use of the term submarine armor as another name for standard dress. Slide. Let me explain how John D. Green became a famous diver in just two months. In June of 1852, Green had just finished five years working as a canal boat operator on the Erie Canal and had made enough money to resettle and start a new life on the Western frontier. So he packed all his belongings and left his hometown of Oswego, New York on Lake Ontario with other family members aboard a steam propeller bound for Cleveland. That ship's name was the city of Oswego. In his book account of this voyage, Green didn't mention the other family members by name, but did say that they included his brother and his brother's in-laws. Slide. The city of Oswego passed from Lake Ontario onto Lake Erie through the Welland Canal. It steamed southwest and got within 20 miles of Cleveland during the middle of a late July night. With no warning and far from shore, it collided with another steamer named the America. There were about 30 passengers aboard the city of Oswego, including John B. Green, and it sank so quickly that 12 people lost their lives. Green himself dived down three times trying to save others before he had to be pulled out of the water himself by the crew of the America. He lost everything in the wreck and among the victims were some of his family members. He spent two weeks combing the shore for his belongings and waiting for the bodies of the drowned victims to float ashore. One of his chests was later found, but it was empty. 
slide. Green then got a small boat and went out to the wreck site, which was in about 30 feet of water and dove down to it without equipment. While he was out in his boat alone, he saw another ship pass by that included a crew and one man suited up in diving dress. Green was curious, so he followed them to the nearby wreck site of a large steamer that had sunk two years earlier, the GP Griffith. Now the Griffith wasn't deep at all, it was only in about 20 feet of water. Green watched the diving crew at work and asked if he could try. Uh, they told him no, that it was too dangerous. Green then did a free dive without equipment down to the wreck and stayed underwater for three minutes just to prove his skill. When he came to the surface, he asked them again and said to them, my sins are upon my own head if anything bad happens. So they let him try the equipment and he was able to stay under far longer than anyone else. Soon he was doing all the diving down to the Griffith. Slide. After they exhausted that site, Green convinced them to sail over to the site of the wreck of the steamer Erie. His new partners discouraged the idea. They did not believe it was possible to dive down to 65 feet. They thought the pressure was too great. But John B. Green scoffed at the danger and believed that he could do it. And he did, uh, recovering some valuables he found on the lake bottom at that wreck site. It's likely that Green and the others in that party had the advantage of working with the very latest Wells and Gowan submarine armor and may not have realized how good it was. Soon every port on Lake Erie knew about John B. Green's exploits. One of that crew that gave Green his start was an older middle-aged man named Martin Quigley. He later became Green's business partner and diving assistant. Slide. So that was how John B. Green uh, came to the attention of Henry Wells, who was trying to recover his American Express safe from the wreck of the Atlantic in August, 1852. Once the Wells expedition reached the Atlantic wreck site and made soundings showing that it laid at 165 feet, the New York Taylor divers and Henry Sears with his new Nautilus diving bell, did not even attempt any dives. They thought it was too deep. But John B. Green did, and he reached the top deck of the wreck, but at that point, his air intake hose started to buckle. All he had time to do was to grab the top end piece of a flagpole. By this time, the Wells expedition had already spent quite a bit of money, so Henry Wells decided to call off the effort. As a souvenir, Henry Wells took the flag finial that Green had recovered and affixed it to the flagpole at his mansion in Aurora, New York. Slide. But Henry Wells didn't entirely give up. He contracted the Atlantic salvage job out to Albert Bishop, who was the inventor of the floating derrick. Bishop built a gigantic new version of his derrick in Buffalo. He decided to test this new design over the wreck of the Erie rather than the Atlantic, which was much deeper. So he towed two connected ships with the tower and crane installed on one out onto Lake Erie and over the wreck site. And he hired John B. Green to place chains around the wreck, which were then to be connected to the Derrick's pulley system. While work was underway, both Bishop and Wells received visits from a man representing diver James Whipple. Whipple offered to come to Buffalo to assist with the Erie effort, but was informed that John Green had been hired already and that he would be given the first opportunity to set the chains in place. And as it turned out, John Green performed his part of the job. But just as everything was ready to raise the chains, a gale swept across the lake and the wind slammed into the crane. The ship supporting the crane tossed back and forth, breaking the braces that connected it to the second vessel 
that was acting as a counterweight. Once that connection was broken, the crane ship tipped over and the tower section slammed down onto the nearby counterweight ship. Both ships along with the crane sank to the bottom of Lake Erie. Amazingly, all the men were able to get off in small boats, but a horse that was hitched to a treadmill went down with the crane. No lives were lost, but it was still a catastrophic loss of equipment. Slide. That was the last straw for Henry Wells. He gave up, but the prospect of of salvaging the Atlantic brought diving suit manufacturers Thomas Wells and John Gowan to Lake Erie. They too hired John B. Green and to test their methods, they also chose to work over the Erie wreck first. They connected two ships with trusses and then mounted block and tackle on those trusses. Wells and Gowan hired a British diver named John Tope to work with Green. Tope and Green arrived at the Erie site and began the job of placing chains around the hull. One day when Green was away in Buffalo, John Tope made a dive to test a new helmet. His exhaust valve failed while he was down below. And after no response on his signal rope, his lifeless body was hauled up. His assistants took off the helmet and discovered Tope's head was horribly swollen and bleeding from every orifice. He had been killed by diver's squeeze, which is a sudden loss of pressure within a suit. Slide. After Tope's death, John B. Green and Wells and Gowan were able to raise the Erie and towed it to Buffalo after it had been in the lake for 13 years. Although this was an engineering success, when they processed the Hulk, they found very little of the rumored gold and silver. In fact, the salvage effort barely paid for itself. This discouraged Wells and Gowan to the point that they gave up on the idea of salvaging the Atlantic. Slide. In 1853, with great secrecy, Laudner Phillips brought his marine cigar to Lake Erie and his atmospheric suit. What exactly happened to the submarine is not known, but one anecdote came to light decades later that suggested that an unmanned test of the vessel failed, that its support chains snapped and the marine cigar sank in over 100 feet of water, somewhere between Long Point and Buffalo, where it probably still rests nosed into the muddy bottom and covered with silt. I don't believe that even side scan sonar would find it now, but what a wonderful artifact it would be if it is found someday. someday. Slide. In August of 1855, John B. Green decided to go after the safe on his own after having participated as hired help in the prior failed efforts. He chartered a ship and crew and returned to the Atlantic site over the deepest part of Lake Erie. He made a series of dives down to 165 feet over a consecutive stretch of five days, groping his way in total darkness around the wreck. No one had yet engineered underwater lamps. He was finally able to locate the wheelhouse and from there followed the deck back to the window of the cabin where he had been told the safe had been left. On August 23rd, 1855, he reached his hand in through the window and touched the safe. He later wrote, then I cried out, my God, I've got it. I'm a rich man. And I wept down there in the waters. I was so glad. He came back to the surface and told his crewmates, I touched the gold and then had his lunch and took a saw down for another dive to widen the window opening. He worked at that quite some time and was able to move the safe in position where it might be lifted out with lines. Slide. Upon doing so, he returned to the surface to get the lines and had his tenders remove his faceplate. 
That last rush of air into his suit hit green like an electric shock. A sharp pain stabbed his legs and then coursed through his body, paralyzing him. He had the bends, decompression sickness, but nobody in the 1850s knew what that was. To put it in simple terms, gas bubbles had dissolved in his blood while he was breathing air under pressure. And when that pressure was suddenly decreased, the gas bubbles reformed and pressed into the nerves of his spinal column. No one knew how to treat him. They rubbed his body with brandy and pepper and made for the nearest town, which was Port Dover, Ontario. The doctors there thought he would die, but after two weeks, he regained control of his upper body and could wiggle his toes, though his legs still did not work. He was taken to Buffalo. While there, he told reporters about finding the safe, but his condition did not improve. Still, he was quoted in the papers as saying, if God spares my life, I will have that money yet. Slide. By the spring of the next year, 1856, John B. Green had recovered only slightly. He could walk with crutches. In July, he hired two divers to go with him back out to the Atlantic site. He sent the first diver down, but after that man reached 60 feet, he signaled he could go no further. So Green sent the second diver down, and he too only got 60 feet before he had to be pulled up. Green was disgusted, so he put on the submarine armor himself and made it down to the wreck at 165 feet. After getting his bearings and finding the cabin window, he reached in and felt nothing. I felt for the safe again. It was gone, all, all my efforts for nothing. Never did I rise to the surface with so heavy a heart. And when he came to the surface, the bends hit him again, worse than before. Slide. When the paralyzed John B. Green was taken back to Buffalo, he learned that just as he had gone out to the wreck, another ship had returned to Buffalo with a crew of four men who had recovered the American Express safe. The diver who performed the deed was an unassuming man from Chautauqua County, New York, named Elliot P. Harrington. But the leader of that four-man partnership was Martin Quigley, Green's old diving partner, whom he had fallen out with two years earlier. Quigley, Harrington, and the other two men thought that they were rich. The safe contained nearly $40,000 in cash and bonds, a fortune for that time. However, before the four men could be, begin to enjoy their new wealth, they received a visit from a legal representative of the American Express Company who came to recover the company's property. The lawyer offered the four men a deal, probably generous of $7,000 or less than $1,800 per man. It was decent money, but hardly worth risking your life for. Slide. Although John B. Green was permanently disabled, he struggled to eke out a living as a tugboat operator. He also wrote a book about his four years as a diver. It remains as the only first person account written by a diver in the 19th century. Slide. Although he could only walk with crutches, John Green also made a tour of cities around the Great Lakes, giving lectures illustrated by a series of scrolling painted canvases depicting the many scenes of his exploits. This medium was called a moving panorama and it was a precursor to motion pictures or, or maybe to PowerPoint and Zoom. Slide. But while researching John B. Green, I discovered that he had not been entirely truthful in his autobiography concerning the events that led him to dive in the first place, namely the wreck of the city of Oswego. I found several different accounts that listed the names of the victims, but the family members that John Green lost were not his brother or in-laws. They were his own wife and little daughter. 
Green must have felt incredible guilt over the fact that he had survived that wreck, but his wife and child did not. Knowing this may explain why he lingered over the city of Oswego's wreck site and why he dared to do dives that others considered reckless. He had already lost everything in his life. Green's moving panorama tour failed to make money and he was accused of leaving towns with unpaid bills. He was also accused of being a drunk. In his last years, he lived in poverty with his mother and sister in Buffalo and relied on charity. However, in the 1860s, American cities were full of men disabled from the Civil War. So there was no large outpouring of support for John Green. In despair, he committed suicide by poison in 1868. Slide. By the late 1850s and 1860s, the advent of railroads had cut the amount of passenger traffic on Lake Erie and use of the Erie Canal continued to fall as it had through the 1840s. The great palace steamer era came to an end. There was still much salvage activity on the Great Lakes, but it wasn't being done by treasure hunters. John B. Green's story, I think, is made sadder by the fact that the men who beat him to recover the safe saw no great profit themselves, nor were they villains. Uh, Martin Quigley had a long, respectable career as a salvage diver, and the diver that brought up the safe, Elliot Harrington, had, had his own good story to tell. In the early 1850s, Elliot Harrington could be found in St. Louis working for James Eads as a salvager of wrecks in the Mississippi. Because the river's waters were so murky, diving bells were used much more than divers. Harrington liked to tell stories about inviting young ladies to go down in the diving bell where they would pluck freshwater oysters from the river bottom and have a picnic there underwater. Slide. During the Civil War, Harrington, uh, can you go forward another slide? There we go. During the Civil War, Harrington was assigned as a salvage diver tasked with clearing the harbors of Virginia and the Carolinas of the ships deliberately sunk by Confederate force, forces to deny access to their ports. While on this assignment in May of 1863 and while the war was still raging, Harrington wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy. He offered to build a submarine vessel for the Navy. And he said, among my experiences was one with a submerged small propeller driven by hand power, capable of being supplied with air by means independent of all outside help. With it, I can make one and a half miles per hour at a depth of 80 feet or less and could conduct operations outside of it at any given depth with success. Slide. There's only one vessel that matches the description that Harrington gave, Laudner Phillips Marine Cigar. So although there is no other proof, I'm convinced that Elliot Harrington was hired to assist Laudner Phillips when he brought his submarine to Lake Erie in 1853 to use it to salvage the Atlantic. Slide. Elliot Harrington was also one of the best collar and elbow wrestlers in the country, despite his relatively short height. He fought in matches against national and world champions. And he was doing this wrestling, even though his body has had suffered lasting effects of a milder case of the bends compared to John Green. Slide. In the 1870s, Harrington invented a water bicycle he intended to use it to paddle from Detroit to Cleveland, but just before his planned trip, he was felled by a stroke. He died in 1879, about 11 years after John Green's death. Slide. Now, you'll remember that I told you how John Green's life changed when his wife and daughter were lost with the wreck of the city of Oswego. Here's another newspaper report from July 1852 
about that wreck from a Boston paper far away from Lake Erie. And here we see mention again of John Green's wife and child. And then just below that is another unrelated report from Western New York State about a dry goods store that burned down in Westfield, New York. That store belonged to Elliot Harrington and that loss forced him to look elsewhere for income. That's when he went to St. Louis to work for James Eads and learned how to go down in a diving bell. Four years after these twin personal disasters, Green and Harrington were both racing for the American Express safe at the bottom of Lake Erie. Slide. I've taken you from the 1830s through to 1856. By the late 1850s and early 1860s, salvage divers could be found in every large American port. Until the advent of scuba, standard dress diving equipment changed very little. Now, the last thing I'd like to explain is the title of my book. Shortly after my book came out, astronaut John Glenn died, but I had been thinking of him even when I was doing my research. He had been one of my childhood heroes and Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff, about the Mercury 7 astronauts is one of my favorites. So as I learned about John Green, Elliot Harrington, Henry Sears, Laudner Phillips, and the others, I constantly thought about how they too were the first men to explore an air, airless environment where their lives depended on new untested technology. My hope is that those who learn about their exploits will realize that they too had the right stuff. And that's why I called this period the heroic age of diving. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jerry. That was that was fascinating. I um I have I have so many questions. I don't I kind of don't know where to start. Um first of all, can and this is just me talking. This isn't even questions coming from our our audience who don't forget if you have anything, make sure you put it into the the QA there. Um as a as a researcher as well, I'm just that that newspaper piece that you showed right there at the end. I just I was I don't know. Those are the kinds of things that as, as a historical researcher, you're like, whole. Oh, I can't, I don't want to say bad words here, but this is where you sit at the library table and go, oh my gosh, how does, how did the, how does the world so small that those two things came together in a single newspaper, right? Yeah, I had to share that because that, that was so startling when I came across that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> pardon me, I am so sorry. Um, I, I know, I mean, I, because I'm an archaeologist, an underwater archaeologist, I do a lot of scuba diving. I know what we do today, but, you know, these guys in these tin suits, how did they stay warm underwater in, because not to be, Lake Erie's cold, Hudson River's cold, you know, these places that they're talking about, you know, and the metal's gonna take it a, take it, absorb the cold as well. Yeah, cold and dark once you go, you know, down about 100 feet or so. Um, uh, well, they fortified themselves with brandy. I, <laughs> I've read that much, um, but uh, you know they they um, also wore a lot of um, wool um, before they got into the suit, um, and and the suit was uh, you know uh, enclosed. Uh, it was um, heavy canvas uh, uh, lining uh, rubber. So it, it uh, gave them some insulation, but you're right, it probably was cold. And um, they also often worked without gloves, which I think is the most amazing part. I don't know how they did that. And again, I think about, I just know today, and there's no way I would dive anywhere in the Great Lakes without gloves, but that's mostly due to the zebra mussel infestation, but it is also very cold. Um, Here's a question from Sophie. Uh, are you a diver yourself? Um, I, I took a class in, in a swimming pool uh, once <laughs> and uh, um, uh, dove in a quarry and, and in uh, uh, Lake George a couple of times, but uh, that, that was a long, long time ago. <laughs> you did, this, this research didn't inspire you to, to go out and try it again? 
now, but uh, I met some uh, um, uh, a group of divers who um, go out with the old time equipment and um, they have a standing offer to me to go and try some of the, uh, uh, the, the standard dress and go down. So maybe one of these days. Maybe. Uh, but sort of as an offshoot of that question, Andrea wants to know what inspired you to research this subject and write this book? Um, well, I, I have written, I had written uh, books before um, about people and events in the 19th century. And while combing through some of the, uh, those old newspapers, I ran across um, articles referring to uh, John Green. And once I started to dig into the story, it just became more and more fascinating and, and more and more compelling, uh, the personal side of it. So, you know, uh, and then especially once I found out that it was his own wife and child that were uh, uh, aboard that ship, you know, I, I, I just had to write this. Okay, excellent. Um, so Hannah's asking, and I, this is a good question. She did mention she has ordered the book. So if this, if anything is in the book that you're about to say, just say it's in the book. Um, but are there any women featured in your book or female divers that you read about from this early period? Uh, there were no female divers um, during this period. And in fact, the first ones I have run across are ones uh, from the, uh, in the 1890s. And, um, uh, uh, Frances Sorcho was one of them. And she also accompanied a uh, Captain Sorcho, who was a, uh, a vaudeville diver who would used to go around with a mobile tank and um, do shows at uh, amusement parks. And his wife, Frances, uh, um, uh, took part in those uh, and also did some diving. Okay. Uh, Kenneth is wondering, and I know a little bit, how heavy was the helmet and the boots, just knowing that they would need to be pretty heavy to stay underwater with the buoyancy of the air? Um, the, the whole outfit was about uh, 200 pounds. And of course, um, that includes the helmet, uh, the flange uh, that the, the helmet is uh, bolted to, the uh, heavy uh, lead uh, shoes, and also, they also um, usually would hang a, a lead weight over their chest plate. But, um, you know, once underwater, uh, that did not deter them at all. So it did mean that uh, they could barely move, you know, once they were brought out of the water. <laughs> Again, as a diver now, and I know how much weight I carry and it's nowhere near that and I can't imagine having that much that much on and and still being able to to move around some um and I know you said you know especially the divers they didn't have uh artificial lighting to be able to use underwater but did they have were they able to use lighting in the diving bells and if so do you know what kind um as far as I know they were were burning lamps in the diving bells they're Again, I, I feel like now I'm taking it down another road. They're not concerned <laughs> about the consumption of oxygen with the. I mean, it, it it wasn't a it wasn't any special mix of air. It right. was just air under pressure. Right. No. I, yeah. Just still. Um, do you know like how many salvage divers are working um, during this time period? So you know, pre Civil War period. Pre Civil War, it was probably um, you know uh, less than two dozen. Um, there are quite a few in Boston, quite a few in New York, and and mainly they were diving in the in the port areas to to recover things that had uh, fallen off of ships there. But the reason there was so much um, Lake Erie became such a proving ground was that um, the technology was just barely there where they could reach many parts of the lake. Um, which was certainly not true of, of the ocean, uh, where most of the depths were way beyond uh, what they could reach, except things that were, had, had uh, uh, wrecks that had happened very close to shore. So I know, and we've talked a lot tonight about um, wrecks in Lake Erie. Were they taking and using this early technology on the other Great Lakes, or is it just 
And again, we talk about Lake Erie being so shallow, but we're talking about 165 feet. There's plenty of places you can get to that probably had sunken ships that needed something in Lake Huron or Lake Michigan or Lake, you know, all, all the other four lakes. So were, were, was there anybody doing work on those lakes? Yeah, uh, there was uh, work, uh, salvage work being done on, on wrecks there. Um, but, uh, you know, the majority of the passenger traffic was, was coming through Lake Erie. Okay. Now, I, okay, so w when we talk about the, the, the reason they're going after these is because of these palace steamers, which are the ones carrying the money and... Exactly. Okay, I, that makes sense. Um, so here's one from Frank, and uh, I may, this may, I can might be able to help a little bit with this. What is the difference between green coming up two times from the Atlantic with the bends and the other four with Quigley and Harrington being not affected? Um, well, Green had did uh, had done all the the heavy lifting for the other four divers. In fact, if you think about it, um, you'll remember that I mentioned that um, after Green got the bends the first time, he uh, went back to Buffalo and told reporters that he had found the safe. And um, it was no secret where the Atlantic was at that time, because Wells Expedition had already been out to it. So they uh, other upper other people knew where the Atlantic uh, was and Green told them that he had found the safe. And Green uh, apparently assumed that uh, um, only he had the skill to go down uh, to, to go and get it again. And he, he was wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm gonna go off of that too. Ron was asking, he says, you mentioned the bends. Is this still a problem in diving today? If not, how is this ailment avoided? I don't know. I mean, I could answer. Oh, this, it's, I mean, it's, it's very definitely a, a problem today. In fact, when I, I was researching the book, uh, I wanted to talk to a diver who had experienced the bends. And I, I talked to a diver who had been paralyzed by it. And um, it, it's 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 a it's a horrible condition, you know, the the way it attacks your your your, your spinal column and nervous system. Um, it really wasn't fully identified until um, they were building the Brooklyn Bridge uh, with the Kassan workers, who were workers who worked in these pressurized rooms that were down underwater. And um, they discovered, you know, that the these crews of men would um, suddenly start having these ailments. And so uh, finally, um, doctors identified that the problem was um, uh, the sudden decompression as they rose up out of those caissons. So that's when they very quickly figured out if they rose them slowly in stages, um, that gave uh, the um, time for the gas in the in the their blood to um, to come out slowly and uh, um, um, cause few, uh, less injury. So um, they very quickly figured that, that out, and um, the divers have been using those diving tables uh, ever since. Yeah. Yeah, again, I guess I'm a diver. You hit it. You hit it right there. I know the Navy had a lot to do with developing the tables, and so yeah, you're right. This is something we still deal with today, but there's so much more awareness and knowledge of it. So um, that's that's one of the reasons we've got that. The, uh, the 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 young man that I talked to that was paralyzed um, when he was brought up with the bends, um, he was on a chartered boat, and the captain really didn't know what to do. The captain radioed the Coast Guard for help. And the Coast Guard came out and airlifted him out. And that's the worst thing that you could do to a, 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 a victim of the bends because as the you airlift them out, you're decreasing the pressure even more. So um, if they hadn't have had done that, he might have been in much better shape. Yeah, I don't even, <laughs> it's just that makes me I kind of wonder what happened and what they were thinking. I had a, yeah, I, had a I don't know. I had a small accident myself about 10 years ago. And in the end, I, it turns out I did, I wasn't bent. I just had some back problems, but 
I did have to get airlifted, but it, I mean, they took a very close out over the water route so they could stay low so that yeah. there wasn't an issue. And there, there are all sorts of degrees of the bends too. You can have the very mild case of the bends and yep. uh, you know, it doesn't do much more than give you a rash. <laughs> well, I don't want to scare people here as, as a diver. It's, it is a very scary thing, but it is very, at least in today's world, very avoidable. Um, yes. and, and so with that, we're hitting right about the eight o'clock. So I think um, it's probably about time to wrap it up. For the couple of you whose questions we didn't get to, um, I'll see if Jerry might be willing to answer some of those um, by uh, email, and then I can pass those on to you when I send out um, the rest of our follow-up. So I do want to say thank you again, Jerry. Um, for those of you that pre-ordered the book, we, again, had more orders than expected. The first order, it will ship out, uh, I believe, tomorrow. We will be placing another order for Jerry's book tomorrow. Um, and if you haven't yet ordered and you would still like to after seeing this fascinating uh, uh, presentation, please go to our online store, nmglstore.org, where you can order his book uh, there and get included in our next uh, big shipment out. Um, in terms of what's going on with the society, I am very pleased to announce we're actually continuing the spring lecture series into April and May, something that we hadn't originally planned on. But so our next uh, uh, talk will be on April 14th at 7 p.m. Uh, Michelle Biggs will be with us. She's the chief park ranger at the Sioux Canal, Sioux Locks, and will pre be presenting an illustrated history of the Sioux Locks. Uh, following that on May 12th, we will have Chris Winters talking about uh, the history of the St. Mary's Challenger. So uh, look for some more information on both of those uh, coming soon. Please don't forget, if you aren't a member, now is a great time to join at nmgl.org backslash membership. And I want to thank you again, Jerry, for your time and expertise tonight. And to all of you that have been with us tonight, happy St. Patrick's Day, uh, Solantia. Uh, have, stay safe and healthy, and we will see you guys again in four weeks. Thank you again, Jerry. This has been wonderful. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.